Hello, I'm Roman Carl. Most of you might not know who I am. For 60 years I've been an active member of 10 Quaker meetings and two yearly meetings. I've served on elders and nominations and premises committees. I've been warden of two meeting houses and the managing trustee of a Quaker centre. For 23 years I was employed in office work, education, research psychology and software development. For the past 25 years I've owned businesses in software maintenance, management consultancy, furniture restoration and now training and coaching. I taught physics and maths in London. I've published research in cognitive psychology and software maintenance for peer-reviewed journals and international conferences and contributed to non-academic journals such as The Friend. I earned a degree in furniture restoration. I was a founder member of the Quakers and Business Group and the lead author of Good Business Ethics at Work and at present I serve on the Development Working Group. When I started my first business I became actively concerned in how we do business. You don't have to believe me, in fact you probably won't. Every day in your office with your customers, your employees, your suppliers you make dozens of decisions where to go, who to see, what to say, how to act, and occasionally you make strategic or policy decisions. Most decisions are small, so small you don't notice them. Small decisions build up until suddenly you don't know how you got here or where to go next. Decisions shape what you do, how you do it, who you do it with, whether they cooperate with you or work against you. Without decisions, nothing happens. No one does anything, no one says anything, and nothing is bought and sold. Decisions are the lifeblood of your business. To have a better business, you have to make wiser decisions. Making a wise decision has several parts to it. A vision of where you want to arrive, how to know when you're there, and when you can't possibly get there. A way to get there, and a method to travel along that way. I believe we need to reach beyond personal opinion, beyond majority consensus, to what, in the grand scheme of things, is right. The QBM has a vision of what is right, a way of finding out what is right, and a method for making decisions. A vision, a way, and a method is still not enough. The way has to be followed, the method has to be used. This stretches beyond theory, prescription, and rules. It's about the practice of the QBM. There are formidable barriers, self-interest, mine and yours, traditions that have worked in the past and will work again, making as little effort as possible, avoiding a decision for fear of error, fear of rejection, fear of challenging authority, constant distractions, and the difficulty of living with piracy, bullying, extortion and abuse. What's the QPM? Everyone knows what it is. It's a simple idea. It's what's in chapters 3 to 9 of Quaker Faith and Practice. Everyone knows how it works and every Quaker committee practices it faithfully. <clears throat> That's an assumption. It's what we all believe. As a scientist, I'm trained to test assumptions. Like the Flat Earth Theory, the assumption works for most of us most of the time. Only under special circumstances do we need to be careful. One circumstance is when the assumption is invalid and people interfere with each other instead of cooperating. Another is when we talk to people who are not Quakers. And a third is when we do research and have to be precise. Let's start with a bit of context. Quaker faith and practice is a prescription. A prescription is not a statement of reality. It's not a definition, a training manual, or a systematic account of a process. It's widely believed that the QBM cannot be taught. It must be experienced over a period of time in order to understand it and to practice it. Therefore, you can't do QBM training as you would in science or in art. Quakers have used it and refined it for 350 years for internal church affairs, secular affairs, and for commercial businesses. So whatever it is, it's practical and therefore has face validity. While there are lots of publications on the way Quakers do their business, starting with George Fox and ending with Jocelyn Dawes' recent book on discernment, they are universally written in spiritual terms, usually in Quaker language, 
often contrasted with the way other people do their business. Studies have been historical or focused on the great Quaker businesses such as the 18th century industrialists or the 19th century bankers and chocolate makers. And except for Ted Milligan, they neglected thousands of small Quaker businesses. None of them saw the Quaker method as a process, a procedure, a craft, or an information processing and decision-making system. The young friend, as part of the young leadership course, asked 13 questions of 60 Quakers and non-Quakers. The researcher was interested in the experience of inclusiveness, but most of the questions were about how people thought of and experienced their business method. To the best of my knowledge, this was the first time anyone has gathered objective, scientific data about Quaker business methods. I expected to find coherent, consistent, shared accounts of business methods compared between Quakers and non-Quakers. My first analyses were disappointing and frustrating. The questions were open-ended and poorly worded and difficult to interpret. The populations were treated differently. Separate populations were represented, but most responses came from one particular Quaker population. The classic researcher would have dumped it as rubbish. I discarded the most difficult material. What was left was just text. It was clear that conventional numerical analysis was not helpful. On the other hand, the researcher and the respondents understood each other well enough for rational, even deep conversation. The challenge was to expose the shared understanding. My solution was to treat the study as a database of sentences, each containing an idea, without worrying about differences between the respondents. I did a simple analysis of the words used. I made a list of key terms based on the phrases in the text and on my own interests and tagged the sentences with the key terms. This is the data I ended up with. 12 questions, 45 Quakers and attenders who gave 399 answers using 19,000 words, 2,749 of them unique and 981 sentences tagged with 239 key terms. That's a lot of data to interpret. The data was fascinating and full of insights. I'm going to highlight the most important insight and the lesson that I took away. I was most curious about people's ideas of systems, processes and engineering in decision making, except for process used in a vague way. None of the systems ideas were in the database. Very disappointing. And unhelpful because there's no way to relate the Quaker business method to other crafts or systems in an objective way. Readability statistics show how easy it is for someone to read a text. These are some of the commonly used indicators. As you can see on the right, you need a college education to read or write the sentences. So this group of Quakers were well educated. British liberal Quakers have been characterised as white, middle class and well educated. So this database is evidence for that subjective impression however regrettable. I found 162 polysyllabic Greco-Latin portmanteau words like these, words I've come to recognise as ephemeral. We all know the ideas they refer to. We all agree on the statements that contain them. But when you try to unpack them to discover what they mean, they suddenly become complex and confusing. They often send the message, we agree on this, but I don't want to talk about it. Next was a group of words with special meanings for Quakers, nearly a hundred of them. In the study, Quakers were talking to Quakers, and it was right to use Quaker language. Most Quakers know that while we use the same words, we don't have the same meaning for words like God, light, leading, ministry, spiritual, and so on. To me, it's blindingly obvious that loaded words are unintelligible to non-Quakers. Some of them, like friend, silence, the tender, clerk, and leading are positively misleading. It gives the impression, I don't care enough about you to make clear what I'm saying. It's not recognizing that of God in you. It builds a barrier that might explain why other people don't use our Quaker business method. I found these terms in the database. If you know what you were talking about, it's easy to see they all mean the same thing, the way Quakers do their business. But each term has a different scope, a different view, and makes different assumptions. I prefer the term Quaker business method. I think it's accurate, objective, systematic, easily understood, and has the widest scope. 
The variety shows fuzziness that allows personal interpretation and freedom of expression. We can agree and work together if we're not too precise in our meanings. On the other hand, fuzziness opens the possibility of confusion that replaces cooperation with interference. At some point, a lack of clarity makes it impossible to compare the Quaker method with other management methods. In the database, I found these statements of what the QBM is. I have my own view as to which is correct. My point is not that there are differences, but that the statements are incompatible. In practice, actions based on them interfere with each other. The evidence from the database contradicts the original assumption. The question is, what do we do about it? A mathematician, locked in the world of logic, would reject the assumption as false. In the real world, we have other options. I said you wouldn't believe me. Here are some of the reasons why. The interpretation doesn't agree with your beliefs and expectations. You can't believe it. If there are no similar studies to compare it with, it can't be true. Roland's not an academic, not a professional survey analyst. His conclusions aren't acceptable. The studies from only one population. You can't generalise to Quakers as a whole. You can't compare Quakers to non-Quakers, so it's not much use. The study's construction was amateurish, the data collection was ill-disciplined, the analysis was unconventional and not statistical. Single sentences might be just the opinion of an isolated individual, so the results are unjustified. What do you believe? For me, the most important takeaway is if we are to work together and get things done, I have to do something about getting a common understanding and coherent processes and shared practices. Another lesson is to translate Quaker speak into business ideas so business people can understand them and use them. In particular, what do we mean in real terms by spirit-led discernment? I've made a start with a glossary on my website. You each have a different point of view. So, what lesson do you take away?